Hello there. Welcome back. If this is your first time, do yourself a solid and go hit that subscribe button. And if you've been listening for a while and you haven't hit that subscribe button, I'm not really sure what to tell you. Uh, do it now. Do it now, because that's you, you just failed. Anyway, welcome back to the show, guys. Thanks for being here. This is the Homesteads and Homeschools podcast. You find all the show notes at homesteadsandhomeschools.com slash 047. Today's guest, he's a political activist, if you will. He um, is very active in the political scene um, here in, in Georgia. He's really trying to raise awareness. Um, he's been advocating for, you know, smaller government, for tighter restrictions on government, um, and the like for for some time. He uh, uh, ran for governor in 2018 on the libertarian ticket. You know, he's been very active in the, the cannabis scene. And that is why I had him on today to talk about cannabis. Um, you know, we always kind of, when we talk about cannabis, when you when you think about cannabis and, and hemp products, we always, we, straight away, we go for the, the CBD and, and the medicinal purposes of the plant. And you know, that's that's all well and good if that's uh, up your alley. For some of us, it's not. For whatever reason, some people don't, and that's okay. But that doesn't mean that the folks that don't believe uh, in cannabis as a medicine should totally throw the plant away. And that was why I had uh, my guest on today to talk about some of the industrial uses for hemp, all the, the good things that it can provide us beyond medicine. So without further ado, let's go plant those liberty seeds with my guest, Mr. Ted Metz. So my, my guest today is Mr. Ted Metz. Um, if you didn't listen to the pre-roll and find out all about him um, and all the, the wonderful things he does for us, um, go back and, and hit the rewind button and listen. But uh, Ted, thanks for coming on. I, I do appreciate it. I appreciate you having me on. So today we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, about hemp, about cannabis, um, and I want to kind of go at things from a more agricultural side of things from the, the industrial side. And there's lots of podcasts and whatnot out there about the health benefits. Um, but uh, I thought it'd be interesting to kind of try to look at things from, from that side. Um, did you grow up like uh, on a farm or, or agriculturally speaking? <laughs> or how, how, when did you like, how did that, because I know you, you moved around for a while. So did you ever kind of get into the, the farm side of things at all? Or um, As a young child, well, my grandfather owned a dairy farm outside of Detroit. So we spent plenty of time, you know, jumping out of the hayloft and such. So I'm a little bit familiar with that. Uh, when my dad moved us to um, the Chicagoland area, we had a farm out there in, in farmland in the middle of nowhere, pretty much. And of course, we'd get hired by the local farmers to bale hay or whatever. Um, so, you know, being around, agriculture in, in a big perspective has been a part of my life forever. Um, I worked one of my first jobs um, as a teenager. I worked for a nursery and we grew or ornamentals. We had a huge greenhouse. We propagated different flowered varieties. So I'm, I'm extremely familiar with the whole aspect of agronomy, you know, agriculture and as well as, um, I guess the botany issue of, of actually propagating, you know, plants from cuttings and such. Good deal. That that's all. It's always that's always been something that's fascinated me. Being able to to propagate things and kind of very interesting science. But was that something you took to to college? I know you you did some OCHEM stuff. Was that like along those lines, or how did you get into that? How did I get into uh, the whole chemistry thing. Well, I, I did take botany. Um, I wish I could remember the 
professor's name. He was, he was a riot, but um, I've been a science nerd my entire life. I, I like love sciences. I did advanced science programs from like fourth grade on, you know, a lot of biology, a lot of that sort of thing and the chemistry, but the um, agronomics wasn't really, it wasn't really a, a area of study for me other than like the horticulture part. I, I enjoyed horticulture. I, I actually worked in horticulture for a long time also. Um, so I'm familiar with planting and, you know, soil preparation and all that sort of thing. Um, I sort of lost track of the question you actually asked me, Ben. <laughs> no, well, like I just, um, so in, in your bio, you did OCHEM and I was kind of wondering how, if that, if they kind of blended together and it sounds like it, it did a little bit in the fact, at least the sense that you're a, uh, kind of science science oriented science inclined so um but well the whole the whole biology aspect um i was also huge into biology anatomy physiology human anatomy human body parts i also went to nursing school and did a lot of other things along those lines but in in biology you know i i, I studied biology and zoology for a long time um the biology perspective sort of like goes right in right into the organic chemistry part of of how do cells like build proteins how do they make enzymes it, and it all has to do with having all of the proper constituents in place when the RNA is going down the DNA string to tell you know to to assemble the molecules to build a protein or an enzyme or or an antibody or something like that so it it all kinds of goes goes hand in hand and that's, that's one thing I can say is like, well, we have a, we have a problem in America right now in that generally speaking, most of the, most of the crop soil that our, our industrial farmers are, are, are growing their crops in really don't have any nutrients left in them. Also the use of, of glyphosate, it's a chelator and, and chelation of, of, um, Basically, all the minerals in the soil are, are clumped together and can't be absorbed by the plant because of, of the glyphosate. Okay. And one of the things we can say about uh, hemp and or cannabis of any sort is that it's a phytoremediator. In other words, what it does, it actually breaks down those clumps of, of, of um, minerals in the soil that are clumped together because of the glyphosate to make them more available to any other crop that you plant. It absorbs the, it. it takes care of the toxins in the soil and in fact it even removes radiation from the soil so just as just as a phytoremediator if, if, if farmers just planted a rotation crop of, of cannabis of any sort in their soil to clean up the soil it would improve everyone's health just because the crops are going to be of higher quality with higher mineral content yeah it, now that um the clumping, the the degradation of, of soil, um, and that kind of happens in any sort of industrial agricultural setup, right? When you're spraying, you know, pesticides and and fertilizers and all this herbicides and all this stuff that you dump on the the ground, um, I mean that beats it up and takes a toll on it after a while, you know. Um, and so it's well, and so the thing about uh, the other thing about. Um Soil in particular, it is supposed to be a microbiome. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to have all sorts of fungi and bacteria and other things in the soil that also help at the root hair level to break down minerals and other nutrients so that the plant can absorb them. And if we're spraying all these things on, on it to kill the microbiome in the soil, the soil is, is no longer an active component in the growth of a plant. I remember doing something like that. I want to say it was in, in high school. It might've been in college. I don't know. It, yeah. You just take like a, a scoop of dirt, a cup of uh, dirt from the woods and, and just like go through it and look at all the stuff that you could find like with your eye and then with a microscope and all these different things. Um, it is, it's, it's amazing. And then when you, yeah, when you think about what we do to it, um, how, how bad you beat it up and, and kill everything in it, um, how unhealthy that really must, must be. But, uh, so how did you, um, when did you start learning about cannabis then about the, uh, the different <laughs> effects of it for, uh, you know, I guess the, the agricultural standpoint of it. I would really 
kind of I'm 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 a little bit older now, and I'll I'll actually kind of go back, um, like prior to Woodstock, you know, at, at like age eleven or twelve or so, my dad, um, got a copy of the Whole Earth Catalog, and that's something I don't even know if you can find those anymore. But the Whole Earth Catalog had everything in it from building geodesic domes to growing cannabis. Oh wow! And and back then the, there weren't really any any um emphasis or actually really any study on on the benefits of cannabis that wasn't really until um Metulum and israel started actually looking at it although there had been studies before of like i think it was 1943 or so there was a study out of uh university hospital in utah that that proved that cannabis cured Epilepsy, epileptic seizures. Okay. Um, but we can go. I, I know we're not really going to talk about the med- medical aspect of this, but I will say that uh, cannabis has been a part of Ayurvedic medicine, you know, the Hindu me- mm-hmm. medicine going back 10,000 years and was in the Chinese pharmacopoeia f- like for le- 5,000 years BC. Um, it, and in 1850s, an uh, uh, Irish scientist doctor brought cannabis back from India and, and made it a part of the U.S. pharmacopoeia from 1850 until 1942, actually, when, when the AMA realized that, that the Marijuana Stamp Act of 1937 included medical cannabis. Prior to that, about 60% of all prescription medications had some sort of, of, of cannabis tincture in it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but we're not we're not talking about that right now, well, right? Well, I mean, it's it's uh, we, we can. I it's above uh, it's above me a little bit, not above me, but like I I kind of I get it. I know there's there's a number of other uh, podcasts out there um, that that talk about it. And I I think it's it's really interesting to think about all the stuff that it does do, um, and all the things that we know that it does. Um, and then when you get into you know, why it's become <laughs> demonized like it has, you know? Um, but, uh, uh, there's, there's two words for the, for the demonization and the outlaw and prohibition of cannabis corporate greed. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, um, yeah, the, nothing, nothing to say to that it's spot on, you know, uh, historically speaking, you know, the strength of, of the United States was built on cannabis. Uh, you know, we we drove the shipping industry with cannabis for sales, cannabis for 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 rope and other cloth. You know, without without ropes and and canvas sails, a, a sailing vessel, you know, couldn't cross the ocean. So you know, farmers back in the day uh, would would grow cannabis in thickets to keep wild hogs from from approaching their crops. They'd use it as a bumper crop because it does have natural pest resistant um, terpenes in it, you know, to, to like repel pests. Um, they'd feed it to the cattle. They'd feed it to the pigs. They'd use the seeds and feed the chickens. So CBD and other, other you know, cannabinoids and cannabinols were in our food supply. If you graph the curve of the incidence of cancer since 1937, you know, it, it, it's kind of like, it, although correlation doesn't indicate causation, it, it is curious that the incidence of cancer has skyrocketed since they took cannabis out of the food supply. Oh, it's scary, scary things to think about. But yeah, it's, uh, it is, it's, it's, it, uh, it's interesting. It's horrible. It's horrible. Well, it's it is horrible. The other thing that the cannabis is very easy to extract the oil and, and prior to, the marijuana stamp act of 1937 farmers would actually use the cannabis oil to make oil for their oil lamps. This of course precedes the rural electrification act. So before, you know, before electricity and, and before the marijuana prohibition, you know, one of the people behind marijuana prohibition was John D Rockefeller just happened Mm -hmm. to be standard oil of New Jersey, but also Andrew Mellon, Andrew Mellon was heavily invested in Gulf oil and, and, you know, standard oil in New Jersey made their money off of kerosene, you know, replacing 
lamp oil with kerosene was was one of the one of the reasons that uh, well that's not the only thing. There's also prior to the Marijuana Stamp Act, the majority of oil based paints was made from cannabis oil. <laughs> so you know what if I'm if I'm refining a, a you know crude oil and I have all this slop to get rid of, what a better way to to get rid of it than mandate its use in other products that um, sort of out you know out outlaw uh, its competitor. Same way with with paper. You know, paper, hemp paper is, is much longer lasting than, than wood paper. It's a lot easier to make. It's less polluting to make. And here's the other guy that was in on the marijuana prohibition was was H. Randolph Hearst. H. Randolph Hearst was one of the first vertically integrated businesses that owned uh, forestry industries to feed his paper mills, to feed his newspaper. So you know, hemp was the biggest competitor. So what do you do? You get your congressman to uh, pass a bill for you to outlaw something to give you monopoly positions. Use that the long arm of the state to make a monopoly. That's how it always seems to go. How do you know when they were, when they were processing it for, for sales and, and all the like there, do how, were they growing it all up and down the seaboard? Was it was it coming out of you know just the south? Was it um, how did how did it grow? Where did it grow? Do you know? Um, pretty much all over, all, all over the known territory. Of course, this um, Illinois ha- was was a huge producer. New York was a huge producer. New Hampshire, all all the eastern seaboard, you know, original thirteen colonies were huge producers. It's something that if we if we wanted to get back to and start using now or growing now. Um, you know, it's not region specific necessarily. We could. Well, here's what is region specific. And, and this is something we really need to talk to talk about is, is, you know, the THC um, tetrahydro actually Delta nine tetrahydrocannabinol is the, what they call the psychoactive ingredient. I'd rather just label it an intoxicant because they don't call you know, alcohol psychoactive, although it is, they don't call, um, you know, Xanax and Zoloft psychoactive, although it is, um, let's just call it an intoxicant. All, all marijuana plants, all, all marijuana plants are from the family cannabis sativa. There's cannabis indica as well. And that's, that's a, uh, like the sister plant, but cannabis sativa produces a range of, well, all THC starts out as CBG, cannabigerol. It's, it's the mother molecule. And, and the gene expression within the plant produces enzymes that breaks the cannabigerol into all of the other CBDs and THCs. So depending on, on your plant genetics, you're going to either have a high CBD level, low THC level, or a high THC level, low CBD level. There's really no in between. It's, it's like one or the other. So um, with our farm bill, this is the issue is that THC is kind of a reactive molecule that, that is produced because of the plant having stress, either from drought or heat or something like that. Mm-hmm. So it's very difficult to grow low THC marijuana, like south of, of the 35th parallel. So there's no such thing as tropical hemp per, per se. And that's why... <laughs> Over half of the crops in Hawaii, the Hawaiian farmers did hemp. Over half of the crops had to be destroyed because of over the 0.3% THC limit that is arbitrarily set by by the Farm Bill. Now, the, here's another thing about the Farm Bill. The Farm Bill specified, you know, defined hemp as cannabis sativa L with less than 0.3% delta 9 THC. Mm-hmm. What they didn't say is that it's 0.3% delta 9 THC or any other THC potential. The USDA issued their issued their farm plan, and they actually added within that farm plan to test post decarboxylation test, which means that any THCA, TH tetrahydrocannabinolic acid, is the precursor to T delta nine THC. 
So a plant can have a, a pretty pretty fair amount of THCA that hasn't been converted into delta nine THC, but because of the way that the farm, the USDA in their in their uh, agriculture plan proposed testing to decarboxylate the THCA so that now you're not testing for just delta nine THC, which is what the Congress demanded, you know, basically in the farm bill of 2018 said delta nine THC, it didn't mention any other cannabinoids or cannabinols, only delta nine THC. And here we have the USD, USDA coming out and redefining hemp as the 0.3% delta 9 THC or any other, you know, THCA. Now they're including THCA, which was not part of the farm bill. They they have like overstepped their boundaries. I don't know if we're going to be able to slap them down, but but uh, two of the senators who wrote the farm bill, the Hemp Farming Act part of the farm bill, actually scolded the USDA. But the USDA's plans, they're so nefarious. They're already, you know, in 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 uh, about. 40 days now, they're going to be the permanent plans unless they change it. And what this means is there isn't going to be any farmer south of the 35th parallel that's going to be able to raise a crop that's less than 0.3% delta 9 THC if it has to be post decarboxylated tested. So that's a real problem for me. That's insane. That's ins- like, t- so it's just, it's the potential. The potential is there for it to, could, could anyone like, aftermarket you know turn the the thca into the thc nine that you know what i mean like could you well and that that's what happens all the time is when you know anyone who happens to use any other form of cannabis that's may not be necessarily hemp but as soon as you put fire to it it converts the thca into delta 9 thc okay um, same same way with with that's what they call decarboxylation. That's how you make um, like can of butter, for example. You heat it up to a point that converts the THCA into delta nine THC. It, it requires time and heat. If you heat it too hot, it'll just burn off. But if you heat it below two hundred and ten degrees Fahrenheit um, for about thirty minutes, if you put your frosty buds into the oven to decarboxylate before you bake baked goods and such. That's, that's how that happens. Okay. So there is THCA present in hemp, but not, you know, just naturally it's not Delta nine THC. So there is a potential to turn a 0.3% Delta nine THC hemp plant with heat into a, like a one and a half percent THC Delta nine THC It's still not enough to really affect you um intoxicating you but it's enough for it to be redefined as marijuana so that the dea and law enforcement can get involved and come and like um you know take your property you know they can seize your property and fine you and take you to court and all this crap and and in my opinion what really needs to happen is they need to define hemp as being less than let's say you know 0.3%, 0.3%, there's so many people have said that 0.3% is arbitrary yeah. and, and not scientifically achievable. And and they're they're pressing for like 1% delt, um, delt 1 delta 9 THC without any other um, decarboxylation testing using any other um, components that may turn into t- delta 9 THC. Wow, that's crazy. That's so, yeah. Anyway, An- another thing that we can do is, is define is, is, is like structure it so that we have two basic kinds of crop categories for human consumption and not for human consumption. You know, that would f- solve that if they want to test things, you know, they don't test, they don't test corn for heavy metals. They don't test wheat for heavy metals or any other pesticides. And here they are, they're there. They want to test you know, they want to test cannabis for, for pesticides and, and heavy metals. To me, that's just like insane that they're not doing that with any other food crop. You, yeah, well, you know what would happen if they tested all that stuff for heavy metals and where, where that would end and nowhere good for, for them and their buddies. But so They'd still what, be feeding them to their kids. I mean, <laughs> do you know where the 35th parallel is offhand? 
I want to say that's that that's I believe is what separates um, uh, Colorado from Arizona. Okay. All right. You know, here in Atlanta, we're we're about thirty three. We're at the thirty third parallel. Okay. All right. So then, okay. Now, I do you know how that would work? How does that work now for where we are? Because I know you know they cannabis or hemp, however they whatever they want to call it, is legal to grow. I guess right, but you have to go through a bunch of a bunch of hoops and get permits and. All, all that business. Um, well, here's here. Let's let's be realistic for a minute. Still in the state of Georgia, hemp is not legal to grow. Okay. So what what was it then that because they passed passed the the legislation? I don't know two years ago, a year and a half ago, and HB three twenty four. Okay, and I remember looking and and seeing that like I want to say Georgia had two two permits. They were going to permit like two people to, to grow it. And there were all these sort of stipulations that went along with it, including, I don't know, I, I feel like you had to pay massive amounts of money just to be considered to get a permit. Am I misremembering that or? Well, you're, you're actually, what you're doing is, is you're, you're conflating two different bills. Okay. There was, there was one uh, for medical cannabis and medical cannabis is a whole different animal. Because they're growing like actually marijuana, which is higher than 0.3% <laughs> right. THC. And then the other one was the industrial hemp legislation. And that um, still requires the Georgia Department of Agriculture to file a plan with the United States Department of Agriculture for approval before they can issue the first permit. Permitting still right now is is, is on, on the books is $50 per acre for, for a license. But in order to get a license, you have to have a contract with a processor. Now, here's a catch-22. <laughs> in order to be a processor, to, to get certified as a processor, you not only have to pay like a large fee for, for uh, like license application fee, not granting a license is non-refundable, but then in order to get the certification, you have to have a contract with a farmer. Or a grower. So here you go. There's catch twenty two. You got to have a, a, a in order to get a license, you have to have a, a contract with a with a processor. In order to be a certified processor, you have to have a contract with a farmer. So that's one of the things we're doing with GeorgiaHempIndustries.com, dot com um, is trying to line up the farmers and the processors, so we can like circumvent the state's ridiculous hurdle there. Now, until the Georgia Department of Agriculture either has a USDA approved plan in place, they can't even start taking applications for a grow permit. Okay. If, if, and let's hope the USDA does not accept Georgia's plan. And if that's the case, then farmers are going to be able to um, get a license directly from the United States Department of Agriculture. Okay. So the USDA already has some sort of guidelines in place then that, that they deem permissible. Um, they do, however, again, these, these are the ones that, 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 that mandate ridiculous testing, the mm-hmm. testing of the flower of the first, you know, the last, the top two inches of, <laughs> of the bud, wherein every other state who's already done this and the international standard for testing is you take the entire like 10 inches of, of a flower bud and, and test the whole thing. You know, they're, they're, uh, they're, they're skewing it to make sure that whatever they're testing is going to have the highest concentration of THCA and THC. So the testing is ridiculous. You know, it has to be carried out in a, in a DEA certified lab, even though the DEA is, has been barred from, from any interaction with hemp, you know, but then again, if it's, if it's more than 0.3, it's no longer hemp, it's marijuana and you can be, you know, jailed for that. Oh boy. So Again, getting back to what we, you know, the fixes are to raise the Delta 9 THC limit to point, you know, to 1% is, is, is feasible. And the other thing is to have the two categories. One is for human consumption, and that's the one you test. And, and the one for industrial applications, such as fiber or, or whatever, doesn't need to be tested at all. You know, do you, you test your cotton before you make it into 
blue jeans? No. Yeah. Yeah. Even, even with like, I mean, I think that's, that's one of the workarounds for, for raw milk, you know, it's sold as not for, not for human consumption, you know, and there it is. It's uh, it'd be pretty, pretty, pretty easy to do, I would imagine. But so what, I guess if we're, if we're not growing cannabis for medical reasons, um, so what, are, what are some of the reasons that we should be growing it then for, for industrial reasons? I know we mentioned how about fiber. Um, well, let's just talk for a minute about like good farming practices. If you, if you use it as a root rotation crop to clean your soil, then your next, you know, your next crop of whatever you're growing is going to be a much better, you know, higher yield, better quality, better nutrition. Also to keep the bugs away. And if you just like, um, till it back into the soil to feed the soil, you're, you're way better off using, using the flower or I'm sorry, the leaves to feed your, your animals is a great way to feed the animals and make them healthy and using the seed, um, to feed your, your poultry is, is another great thing. So if you're not using it for anything other than just, you know, good farming practices, you know, what else, what else do you need to do with it? I mean, <laughs> there are so many different things you can do with it as an industrial product. And, and that's something that we really need to work on over the next couple of years is, is building the infrastructure to actually properly utilize all the aspects of the plant. Cause it can be made into plastics. It can be made into different biofuels. You know, right now, if I, I did some calculations um, last year, uh, we were supplementing 195 million acres Um to not farm anything, you know, those are the farm subsidies to keep, you know, no, no growth. If, if we planted one crop of, of, of marijuana, of, of hemp in that 195 million acres, a direct conversion into biodiesel would generate enough biodiesel to fuel every diesel engine on the planet for two years with one crop. That's impressive. So, you know, just, just using it to convert directly to, to some biofuel, we could end, you know, all of the Middle East wars. Yeah. You know, we could we can end this this thirst for oil with something that's renewable, green, and and carbon negative, actually. You know, and that's that's what we should be we should be just growing it for the carbon sequestration. Yeah, I, I and I think that's something that we I think when when you think about cannabis and when you think about cannabis legislation and, and all that stuff, we always kind of look at the the medical aspects of it, um, you know, the, the health benefits of it and the the industrial side kind of gets pushed to the wayside. Um, and I, I really, it, it's, it's too bad because I think there's so much to it that, you know, we, we all could really benefit, you know, and you think about some of the, the green movement got behind you know, the industrial uses of it, you know, the, the clean energy got behind hemp usage, you know, um, it, it would be, could be. Impressive. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about fiber in particular, you know, there's, there's all sorts of textiles applications, you know, actually the word canvas was kind of like a bastardization of the word cannabis, cannabis, canvas. That's, that's what, that's what it was. You know, that, that cotton raising the, Production of cotton actually accounts for 60% of the world's consumption of petrochemicals for pesticides and, and other things. Wow. So cotton is actually like one of the most polluting plants raised for, um, raised for textiles. Hemp, you know, using hemp at, for textiles, it is a much better fiber. It's longer lasting. It has anti antimicrobial properties. All right. Uh, it's the longest, strongest, natural, naturally occurring fiber. It can be used for everything. I'm actually wearing a hemp t-shirt, and and the comparison between the hemp t-shirt and the cotton t-shirt, it's a lot stretchier. It's a lot warmer. Actually, hemp cloth has two hundred percent more insulative properties than cotton wow just to think about that and then (laughs) you know you there's already people making shoes and and the original levi's 
Levi's jeans was originally made out of hemp. And and the thing about hemp is it never wears out. Like I've some of my, if I had hemp jeans, you know, I'd I'd be wearing the same pair of hemp jeans for like 10 or 15 years before I either outgrew them, but they would never wear out. Yeah, I, I had a, a hemp t shirt back in high school and man, that thing lasted forever. I think I ended up losing it, to be honest with you, but so yeah, it's uh it's an impressive crop and uh I don't know. Hopefully one day we can just, you know, plant some. Uh, you don't have to get a, a permit to do it. I got a little little garden out here and I wanna put down a cover crop in the winter and maybe I'll do that or something, you know. But well, in Georgia, it's kind of a unique environment. You know, the, the, they, they say there's like a 90-day grow cycle for hemp. In Georgia, there's places in Georgia where you could probably get three crops. Yeah, I, I remember reading that. I don't know if I, I heard you say that or, or read it somewhere, but because of that that shorter grow cycle and our, our longer growing season down here, um, I mean, you know, you think about that, getting getting three crops out of – the ground out of anything, um, especially something that, that useful, you know, it's, uh, well, I, I know farmers in North Georgia that'll do it. Uh, uh, you know, they're, they're, they, they do soy, they'll, they'll do a crop of soy. And then after they harvest, then they'll plant a winter wheat, but, you know, let's talk about some other things. I mean, all of the oil, we could, we could replace oil based paint with hemp oil based paint, hemp cooking oil. Um, all the cosmetics, soap, shampoos, lotions, all that sort of thing. And, you know, the, the cosmetics industry alone is, is a huge growth potential to get away from some of the other um, more chemical-based, um, phosphate-based polluting chemicals. So that's, uh, I, I didn't think about that, but I, yeah, because that's you always the, – the makeup companies and all that, it's always pretty – chemically laden there's already a couple of companies that are that are producing hemp hemp board to replace like plywood Mm -hmm. hemp fiber board there's there's a there's a hemp flooring company that you know every part of the hemp plant can be used for something um so i i think you may you may have heard of hemp creek where they just basically take the herd and and mix it with uh lime essentially that's all they have to do and then it forms a, a, a very hard material, very long lasting that just happens to be fireproof, termite proof. And, and if you can imagine having all of the houses built out of hempcrete, you'll, you, you could retire the fire department. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, oh, man, I, I, uh, I'm sure you go on. I, I appreciate you coming on. Um, and uh, I don't know, I, you're, I know you're, you're always active in, in stuff. Uh, where, where should people go to find out more about either what, what you've got out there or, or if people are interested in cannabis and, and hemp um, production or, or the growth aspect of it? Um, any, any idea where to, where to send them? Well, I've, there's a couple of different places. They can, they can go to georgiahempindustries.com. Okay. Um, that's pretty much Georgia, you know, focused solely on Georgia. And, and getting hemp in the ground and, and, and helping to build the infrastructure because, you know, we need, we need infrastructure for processing to process for all the different various uses. If, if they say there's 25,000 uses for cannabis and we've got one processor that just, you know, makes CBD oil, that's, 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 that's certainly not enough. I, I do want to mention um, that hemp seeds is nature's perfect food. It's got 22 amino acids, three omega fatty acids, a perfect combination of protein, carbohydrate, and fat. Um, Hemp seed can easily be made into hemp milk, and hemp milk is a much more nutritious and much more beneficial than any other synthetic milk. You know, if you're drinking soy milk, you should pour that crap out and replace it with (laughs) hemp milk. It's even better than, than, than cow's milk. Also, a gallon of hemp milk takes about 10 gallons of water to produce where a gallon of cow's milk takes about 8,000 gallons. Cause you got to water the crops that the cow eats. You got to, you know, you got to water the cow, blah, blah, blah. So, you know, as far as saving the planet, hemp can save the planet. It is the green 
solution for energy, for food, for fiber, for everything else. Okay, so that's one place is GeorgiaHempIndustries.com. You can find me at, at Ted Metz for Georgia on Facebook. And I also have a website, TedMets.com, which is not necessarily updated to the fullest right now, but you're welcome to take a look and see some of the things I'm up to. Um, we're gearing up for the 2020 election cycle as well as the 2020 legislative cycle. We'll be down there fighting for hemp and fighting for cannabis rights and decriminalization and, and so many other things. Good deal. Yeah, I, I put those links in the show notes. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a good deal what you're doing. I, I appreciate it. And um, I know there's, I'm sure there's information out there that uh, might be Georgia specific, but you can take take to your, your state as well. Um, so anyway, Ted, I, I appreciate it. I thank you and uh, yeah, have a, have a good one. Again, thanks for having me on. Anytime, I'll, I'll, I'll talk all day long about hemp and cannabis both. back that was my guest mr ted metz um it's a pleasure to have him on he's so knowledgeable so so knowledgeable and uh i will put those links in the show notes check him out um really an interesting guy and uh he's pretty pretty open to talking and to um getting information out there and uh even if you're not in georgia georgiahempindustries.com uh, there's quite a bit of information there just about the plant itself you know how it works, and some a lot of it is Georgia specific, but um, I think there's probably something there for for everyone. And uh, I hope you guys out there, um, if you looked unkindly on this plant, um, maybe it changed your mind a little bit. Um, you know, we're, we're always talking about uh, making the world greener, about saving the earth, and global warming, and all this stuff. And we have a plant that. Uh, could help us out quite a bit, uh, whether it's soil remediation or textiles or whatever it may be. It's here. It exists. Uh, we just have to tell tell government to get out of it. Um, like Ted and I were talking, you know, it, it's legal to grow here. Uh, I could grow it here. So many rules placed on it. Um, and as he was saying, so many sort of catch-22s put on it that, yeah, you can grow it, but it's almost impossible to actually grow it and it just you know but this is that's part of the course for for big government and their cronyist schemes you know uh, don't want to set the apple cart too much there but uh, i hope you guys got something out of that anyway if you have not bought your christmas presents yet homesteads and homeschools.com slash amazon click that affiliate link go buy your christmas presents and uh i'll get a small percentage of that and you won't even notice but it will help me. It'll help me buy Christmas presents myself, or or it could just help pay for the podcast. I guess that works too. Um, like I said at the beginning of the show, hit that subscribe button. Tell your friends. Share this around. Um, if you have friends that uh, you know aren't keen on on cannabis, aren't keen on hemp, uh, share it with them. There's lots of information in it for for everyone. So uh, do that. Do that. I appreciate you guys coming back week after week, lending me your little ear holes and all of your time that you could be spent doing other things, I guess. I don't know. I I assume most of you are multitasking while you listen to my fabulous voice. But if you're not multitasking, then I guess thank you even more. Anyway, folks, that is all for today. Get out there. Enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy your weekend. We just had a, a fabulous weekend of 60s and 70 degree temperatures. We uh, butchered some chickens and got some firewood in, did some weeding, and it was just an excellent, excellent weekend. And I hope you all have just a productive week as I had weekend. Anyway, folks, get out there. 
Sow those seeds of liberty. We can all reap sheaves of freedom together. I'm going to write us this dream. I'm going to write us this dream. I'm going to write us this dream. Thank you.